Hey everyone! In a previous episode, we took a quick look at the Atomic Force Microscope. The AFM lets us see the structure of our nanomaterials in incredible detail. While very powerful, the AFM can't tell us anything about what the sample is made of. In fact, there's no single machine in existence that can tell us all we might want to know about a material. All is not lost, though. We can actually find out an enormous amount of information by looking at how our nanomaterials interact with light. The first thing to understand is how energy is stored in a molecule. There are three main ways. The energy of the electrons whizzing around the atoms, the vibrations of the bonds between atoms, and the rotation of the molecule as a whole. The lowest energy state, where all of the electrons have the least energy possible and the molecule isn't vibrating or spinning at all, is known as the ground state. Everything we do to a molecule in its ground state will increase the amount of energy it has, so we can think about the energy states like the rungs on a ladder. The amount of energy in the molecule is measured in electron volts, or EV. If we shine some visible light onto the molecule, we can push one of the electrons to a higher level. This gives the molecule around one electron volt of energy. Alternatively, we can heat up the molecule, which causes the atoms to start vibrating like masses held together by springs, and the molecule starts spinning around. These two different effects happen on very different energy scales. Bond vibrations have energies of a few milli-electron volts, equivalent to light in the infrared range of the spectrum, and a thousand times less than an electron excitation. Molecular rotations have the lowest energies, much less than a milli-electron volt. This is on the same energy scale as microwaves, and is actually how microwave ovens heat food. They excite the rotational modes of water molecules using a very specific microwave frequency. Now let's put those energy scales in perspective. Think about how much effort it takes to throw a ball up by 10 centimetres. That's a microwave excitation of a rotational state. Then, if you throw that same ball up to the roof of your house, about 10 metres, that's an infrared excitation of a vibrational state. On this same energy scale, an electronic excitation is like throwing that same ball 10 kilometres up into the atmosphere and over the top of Mount Everest. Now we understand how energy levels work, there are a couple of ways we can start to study chemistry using light. One is infrared spectroscopy, and the other is Raman spectroscopy. In infrared spectroscopy, we shine an infrared light on the molecule and measure which wavelengths of the light get absorbed. Because the molecule can only absorb discrete units of energy due to quantum mechanics, only light with the same energy as the gaps in our diagram get absorbed. The spectrum we produce directly tells us the energies of the bond vibrations. Heavier atoms and weaker bonds vibrate slowly and therefore have low energy. Conversely, light atoms and strong bonds vibrate very quickly, with a high energy. Raman spectroscopy works in a very different way. We use a very powerful light source, like a laser, to temporarily put our molecule into an excited state. The molecule will relax back to a lower energy by re-emitting some light. If the molecule relaxes back into the same state it started in, then the light emitted has exactly the same wavelength as our laser. This is called Rayleigh scattering. There is, however, about a one in a million chance that the molecule relaxes into a different vibrational state. When this happens, then the light that leaves will have more or less energy, and so is a different wavelength to the original laser. This is Raman scattering. By measuring the spectrum of Raman scattered light, we get a complementary picture of the bond energies in our molecule to infrared spectroscopy. Between these two chemical spectroscopy techniques, we can learn a huge amount about the chemistry of materials, like how many defects our graphene has, or how many layers a flake of molybdenum disulfide has. This kind of information is key to unlocking the potential of these materials in new technologies. Now I hope that has illuminated some of the ways we can shine a spotlight on the chemistry of materials. See you next time! Thanks for watching everyone. If you like what I do, please consider supporting my work via my Patreon page, where you'll have access to a range of in-depth discussions on the physics, chemistry and engineering of nanomaterials. If you'd like regular updates, please subscribe and like the video. It helps so much, and I look forward to talking to you again soon.